So we're going to jump into the message. Guys, I'm, uh, Christmas is next week. You know that. It's next Monday. <laughs> okay? And I am thinking about, it's Christmas time, so I'm thinking about Mary. I'm thinking about the shepherds. I'm thinking about Jesus. You know, I'm thinking about the expectancy of the season, the, the weightiness, the heaviness, the joy, all the thoughts. I tend to get really reflective at Christmas time and just, and then it's also the end of the year is like right around the corner from that, you know? So all the things, they just kind of settle on me towards the end of the year, and I get really reflective. Uh, you know, and as Christmas comes and I think about who I'm going to see, maybe I'm the only one who does this, but I wonder if my gifts are good enough. You know, like if, if what I bought was going to be good enough for the people I'm going to give it to, uh, who I left out, you know, because inevitably I left somebody out, not on purpose, definitely on accident. And then how I wish I could just be better every year, you know, like, man, what, when am I going to be so good at it? I've got, I know people who are, who are done with Christmas in October, they're wrapped, they never miss anybody because they got so much time. And I'm like, one day, <laughs> probably never. Uh, but you know, like so many, th- so many things, just kind of swirl around. And then, you know, there's the Christmas music going, you know, dashing through the snow in a one horse open sleigh. And in my life, it's more like I'm tied up behind Cruella DeVille and we're slashing through the streets on a dented, beat up trailer, you know, like Christmas time and the holiday season. I want things get so busy. You know, I want to do all the things. I, you know, I want to decorate my house naturally. Uh, I want to go look at lights. I want to take my kids to look at lights. I've got people, you know, second and third graders. They're still like very much in love with the season and, and the doing things. We love to go ice skating every year. Haven't made it ice skating yet. Uh, making a gingerbread house. Like there are so many fun things. But what happens is at Christmas time is everything ramps up, you know, nothing slows down. Now you got, you got holiday parties, you got church parties, you got your, your spouse's holiday party, and then you still have to wrap gifts. Like you still have to do all the things and work doesn't slow down. A lot of times work speeds up because it's the end of the year. You got to get all the things in, all the things done. If you're a bookkeeper, all the books have to be done. Like next level increase happens around the holiday. And so what happens every year for many is the expectancy of the season meets with the inadequacy that often lurks under the surface in us, creating kind of this whirlwind of emotions and reactions that we hadn't anticipated. You know, we look forward with joy, joy to the world, and so we look forward with joy, but at the same time, it's like all this stuff kind of comes up in us that we hadn't anticipated, we didn't realize was there, or we knew was there, and we just hope we could keep buried. (laughs) But somehow, sometimes, it just kind of swirls up. There's ups and downs from day to day or moment to moment, and there are plenty as the year races to a close. And as all the anticipation, the expectation, the questions stir around me, somewhere deeper inside, I sense an invitation to reflect on the power that was present the night that Jesus came to earth as a baby. And it was that power, not just that he came to earth as a baby, but there was power. There was power to bring deep peace and assurance to the hearts of his creation. And so there's an invitation to explore that, to, to question and to wonder and, and really grapple with what was the power and do I have it in my everyday life? And it meets when that, when that inadequacy and some of the stuff of the season, like all the humanity bubbles up inside of me. And then I look over to you know the creator and the wonder of the season and go, where's the power and what does that look like? And what more are you inviting me into that I haven't seen yet? yet. And so as we close our Joy to the World series today, the title of today's message is Out of God's Way. (laughs) And what I want to do is I want to look at three stories that converge on the night of Jesus' birth. And then I want to follow what we know about Mary, the mother of Jesus, to help us see how powerful the peace of God really is. And so I kind of want to touch on the peace of God. So Mary's story opens to us when an angel visit her, visits her. I'm going to read three of the most famous passages of Scripture around Christmas time, okay? So, so brace yourselves. Uh, but we're going to open in Luke chapter 1, verses 28 through 35, and this is where Mary's story kind of opens to us for the first time. It says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. 
Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. We're going to keep looking at it, but I want to move forward. So Mary isn't alone because there's Mary, but she's engaged to Joseph and he too has a story. So I want to see like this is where we're introduced to Joseph and we get his story. It's in Matthew chapter 1. Verses 18 through 21, it says, This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. So we have Mary's story, and then we have Joseph's story regarding Jesus. And then we're going to come to the night Jesus was born. But first off, I just have to back up and say, I think everybody on planet Earth at that time thought Mary and Joseph were insane. Okay, because Mary's pregnant, you know, supernaturally by the power of the spirit. Joseph naturally is going to divorce her because that's the right thing to do when you've been, you know, whatever. Um, Cheated on. Okay, so that that's what he's going to do. And then there's a Joseph has a dream. So there's no other witnesses. There are no other witnesses to what happened with Mary and what happened with Joseph. But together they decide this baby that's inside Mary is not ours. It's not anybody else's. It belongs to God. And so all on their own, they've got to carry the burden of the promise of the Lord. All on their own, there's there's a promise given to them. There's a power, there's a prophecy that they're carrying. But to the rest of the world, they seem kind of insane, you know? Like they're holding on to some kind of crazy hope. And it doesn't make any sense to any outsider looking in. But I'm So I'm amazed at how much they leaned in and just trusted God through that kind of insanity. So Luke, and then I want to pick up uh, the shepherd. So this is the night Jesus was born, Luke chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. So three times we meet angels, three times, don't be afraid because it's terrifying. (laughs) He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to him about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And then the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So those are the three stories that kind of converge on the night that Jesus was born. And this is what Mary knows as she snuggles that baby boy. She's a first time mom. That that baby really ain't hers. You know, like supernaturally it was conceived. And she's snuggling that baby boy on that night. And this is what she knows. He's going to be very great, and he's going to be called the Son of the Most High. He's going to reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom is never going to end. He's going to be holy, and he will be called the Son of God, and he will save his people from their sins. And his coming is good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The burden, the weightiness of Mary that night 
snuggling that baby going, what on earth is this going to look like? (laughs) Because that's immense power. That's immense promise. But as he grows up, those promises, if we look at the whole story of Jesus, they seem to be kind of incongruent because we know from the scriptures that Mary and Joseph, after they have Jesus, they do get married and they do have relations and they have other children. So Jesus has brothers and sisters. And we also know from scripture that Jesus, brothers and sisters, saw he was crazy. They did not believe. I mean, they, they heard the stories like Jesus is like stepchild. You know, he's, he's like, he's half because they got the same mom, but really that's a blended family. It's a mixed family and he's supernatural. He's the son of God. He's going to be called God of the most high. Mary knows this. Joseph knows this and their kids like, you know, it's Joseph all over the, the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, like there's favoritism. And I don't think they favor Jesus, but there was tension in that household. You got to imagine that there was tension and there was discord because they didn't believe in each other. At least they didn't believe in Jesus. And so there was a power struggle. There was tension. There was confusion. And then, so Mary, and so I, I want to focus on Mary because she's, she's the mom, number one. And number two, she treasured these things in her heart and she watched them unfold. The promise was given to her to carry and she watched it unfold. So when Jesus is older and his ministry begins and people are seeing him, he's mighty in power. He's able to heal. Large crowds of people begin to follow him. Still his brothers and sisters don't believe in him. They still think he's crazy. He's still not wanted by the people of his hometown. He's rejected by by the people of Nazareth because they knew who he was as a boy. And so imagine the family, again, the mom and dad, or at least mom, is carrying the burden of, I know what the promise is, but why doesn't any of this look right? Why doesn't he seem to be received as who I know him to be, who he was revealed to be to me? And so as he, uh, you know, gains power and influence, the influential religious leaders want him dead. And his mom knows that, you know, so Jesus resorts to, he doesn't hide, but he does, he hides, <laughs> you know, he takes the, the winding roads about and he doesn't make his glory known all the way. So I imagine that Mary has some ups and downs in her thoughts as she watches the life of her holy son unfold. Because you know, imagine Mary, he may be holy and he may be the son of God and his conception was miraculous, but she still carried him for nine months <laughs> and he came out of her. And so that's her boy, you know, that's her boy. No matter how holy he is, it's her boy. And so at the end of Jesus life, though, if we, if we follow the gospels all the way through the end, we know that Mary is there when Jesus is put up on the cross. We know that she followed him the whole way. She's watching. She has been following. She never left him. She never rejected him. She never turned her back on him. She just watched with wonder. She watched with wonder. She kept following. She kept watching. She kept looking. She kept waiting. And so she's there when he's put up on the cross. And this is what I kind of want to unpack. Mary had been given a promise, but she had to live with faith each day as that promise unfolded. She had been given a promise, but she had to live with faith each day as that promise unfolded. And sometimes, sometimes as that promise was unfolding, it seemed like the promise brought more heaviness than it did great joy. The promise felt like it brought more heaviness than it did great joy. But when that section of the story closed, when Jesus did breathe his last, and now we're all the way at Easter, (laughs) when Jesus did breathe his last and the earth split in two, that's what it says, the earth split in two, and he was raised to life three days later. And when he ascended up to heaven, because she was there for that, and the Holy Spirit came in power upon all the people who trusted in Jesus, there was good news of great joy for all the people. When that happened, there was peace on earth to those with whom God was pleased. There was, and we come back to the opening statement, there was real power to bring deep peace and assurance to the hearts of his creation. But it was over a lifetime. It was over 30 years that that promise unfolded. And there was watching and waiting. And there was heaviness. And there was burden. And there was sadness. And there was confusion. And there was things that seemed to be incongruent. But at the end, at the end, there was hope. There was peace. There was promise. And so the question is, what is peace? Kind of what I want to touch on. A person who is at peace is stable. They're calm, they're orderly, and they are at rest within. So being at peace means that you're at rest even when everything else seems to be all wrong. You know, it's one thing for the world to be falling apart. It's another thing for us to be falling apart with it. (laughs) You know, and that's not who we're called to be. So often our own thoughts are what disrupt our peace. Our own 
thoughts are what disrupt that, that inner sense of peace. And something as simple yet profound as realigning our thoughts with the truth of a situation can change everything. It can change our outlook. It can change our courage. It can change our trust. So Mary had to hold on to what she had been told, even when what she saw threatened what she believed. So when things looked incongruent, when things looked bad, when there was tension in her house, she probably went to her room and said, his kingdom will never end and he will save his people from their sins. <laughs> and she doesn't know what that looks like. Like she's still carrying the burden. She's carrying the promise and things don't make sense, but that's all she's got to hang on to. And she does hang on to it. She hangs on to those promises. So maybe for us, let's kind of make it relatable. Something really simple has the capacity to send us into a crazy downward spiral, you know? Like, let's just take, for example, because I can get there in a hurry around Christmas time with gifts. I'm not the greatest gift giver. I really want to be, you know, like I want to crush every year. And, you know, when I'm on a set budget that I set myself, I think, well, this is what I got, so what can I find on Black Friday, you know? But what happens is, as it gets closer, if, if I get too much in my head, I can wonder, did I get the right gifts? Or I'm showing up to a party or a place or someone's coming over, and I've got gifts for somebody else, but I don't have gifts for another person. And then I think, well, I couldn't get any gifts for that person. And so now I can't show my face. It's, this is so, it's so silly. And I, I'm, but, but for some of us, for some of us, it's gifts. For some of us, it's, it's other things. But one little thought sends us into this downward spiral of becoming despised and dejected. I can't show my face. I can't show up. I don't have enough. I'm not worth enough. I don't bring enough value to the table. Uh, if, I, if I enter the room, like, I don't, I don't have what it takes. And so we, we find ourselves poor and despised and rejected in our own minds. And then all of a sudden our confidence is shattered and who we are is shattered. So much like the Israelites of the Old Testament, if we look back to the Israelites of the Old Testament, we can find ourselves living in the land of promise, but not looking to the God of the promise. Living in the land of the promise, but not looking to the God of the promise. In other words, we're in church and we're involved. We serve on the dream team. We're, we're involved in our community. We're looking for ways to bless others and to bless people. We're looking to the right and to the left. And we're trying to do the good things that the people around us are doing. We're doing the good things that our brothers and sisters are doing. We're in the land of the promise but we're not hearing from the God of the promise. So on Sunday, we worship the one true God and we are reminded of his strength. We're reminded of his power. But on Monday, we worship something else, a schedule, a paycheck, status, our comfort, a relationship. And then that voice becomes louder than Jesus' voice does. And we begin to doubt or we disregard altogether that the one we worshiped on Sunday, the one who rescued us and redeemed us, is big enough to sustain us today in the middle of my week, in the middle of my circumstances, in the middle of my sadness, in the middle of all the thoughts swirling around in my mind. Does he even see those? Does he know those? And is he able to rescue me from that? So we learn from Mary, don't let your circumstances or your surroundings be the lid on what is possible, but hold on to the God of the promise. Or this is the one fill in the blank. We let go and we let God. We let go and we let God. Now, when I say let go and let God, the first thing that pops into my head, I'm going to offend so many people right now. (laughs) Is that song, Jesus, take the wheel? You know the one? You know the one? Ah. Um, I think, okay, never, my opinion probably doesn't matter. Anyway, when I let go, let God, and I think, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, I'm like, in my mind, when people say that or that song is sung, I don't know the, the writer and I don't know all the words because I don't love the song, okay? But I think when, when people say, Jesus, take the wheel, or we let go and we let God, what, what I imagine people think is I just completely get out of the way and I hand it over and I turn my back on it. Like, Jesus, take the wheel. Are you even still in the car? You know, like when Jesus took the wheel, you got out of the car and you let him either crash it or fix it, but you abandoned it a long time ago. You know, like you didn't remain a passenger in the seat on the ride. You gave up, 
you know? So letting go and letting God, that doesn't mean I throw my hands up in the air and I turn my back on it and I just let God, God deal with it and then I walk on to something new. Like, you're going to deal with that. I'm headed off to something different. I'm going to go create a new mess over here and then I'll throw my hands up and give you that one. Like, that's not what let go and let God means. Let go and let God doesn't mean drop it or turn your back on it forever. It means let Jesus be your teacher. Let Jesus be your teacher, which means you have to stay engaged. <laughs> you have to stay engaged and carry it. Now, to any parent who has ever had to help their kid with homework, anybody? Anybody in the room? You know how to do the work. You're a grown-up. You graduated. And then your kid needs help with math homework or writing. Whoo! And then they just kind of hand it over to you. And you do the work. And I've, I'm a, t a terrible parent, great parent. I don't know what I am. I'm a drill sergeant. You know, I'm a homeschool mom. So my kids don't even have homework. They just have work. Okay? And they'll kind of get, eh, this is too hard. Like, you got to do the hard stuff. And then they'll, they'll need help with something. And I'm like, listen to me. I know how to do this. And I'm not in school. I don't need to learn how to do this. You need to learn how to do this. Like, it's not my problem. I, and the, here's the thing. I have compassion. I will help you. I will try and get you to understand it in a different way. If I need to teach it differently so that you get it, I will do that. I remember my dad, when I would have math homework, I like math. I'm not the greatest at it. I also hate writing, so school. I was good at it, but, like, nothing was like, eh. My dad, though, was really good at math, and he would help me with math. And I loved when he would sit down and just, help me process. But how many of you know like what you learned your kids don't learn, you know? They taught they they came up with a new way to produce formulas. And you're thinking, I know how to get the answer, but you're going to get it wrong because it's not this way. So my dad would do that. He would show me and he would he would teach me another way so that it would click in my brain so that I could get to the right answer. And then I had to figure out how they were they were doing the equation. But he was good to me. He was kind to me. He sat with me. He didn't do the work for me. I had to stay engaged. But he taught me, he got me to the place where I could get it so that I could understand the process better from a different point of view. And so that's what we've got to do with Jesus. Let go and let God means I lean in and I let him be my teacher. One of the things that Jesus is always showing us and he's always teaching us is to believe his words over any other words. Believe my words over any other words. And this is something we can put into practice and it's measurable. That's what I love about it. It's, it's more than something we can believe in or like, but it's a measurable thing we can do. If we put it into practice, one month later, we can look back and say, okay, I am better today than I was then because I have put this one thing into practice. I am more confident. I am more secure. I am more hopeful. I have more faith. I, I can believe for other people. It's a measurable thing. So much like um, setting an alarm clock, I borrowed my daughter's alarm clock. And you guys remember these? How many of you guys use your phone? Like what the heck's an alarm clock? You have your phone. I use my watch because I hate noise. If I hear the noise of the alarm clock, I'm going back to sleep for at least 30 minutes. <laughs> it's like this sound. I have, because I hit the snooze button so often, I have programmed myself that if the alarm goes off, it means 30 more minutes of sleep, you know? <sighs> Okay, so it's much like setting an alarm clock every day for the same time. Let's say you got to be at work at 6 a.m., so you're setting your alarm for 4.30 or 5 o'clock. After a while, you don't have to set the alarm anymore. You still do because you don't want to be late for work. But after a while, you don't really have to set the alarm anymore. Your body just wakes up at that time. You have programmed your body to wake up at a certain point of time, and your body knows it's time to go to work. So I'm awake, I'm up, I'm alert. Even if you're to a day off and you're not setting the alarm and you're going to snooze, like you still kind of stir at that time, and then you have to decide, am I going to get up? Or am I going to sleep in because it's my day? We have, we, you can program yourself, your body, to do the things that you want it to do. In this, you can, it's the same with your mind. It's the exact same thing with your mind. You can fix your thoughts on God's words in the same way that you set an alarm clock for the same time every day. And if you make that a habit, then what happens is when a destructive thought comes into your mind, your internal filter will reject that as counterfeit. In the same way that you can set your body to wake up at the same time, you can program your body to recognize lies as counterfeit and you can reject them if you fill your heart and your mind with the truth of God's word and you believe it and you meditate on it and you chew on it and you question it and you get it inside of you. So Mary reminded herself when things looked bleak, he will be very great. 
And he will be called the son of the most high. He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. He will be holy and he will be called the son of God. He will save his people from their sins. His coming is good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And because she kept those words in her heart and because she thought about them often, she was able to hold on until the end and she saw the fulfillment of God's promise. She saw joy come to the world and peace come to her own heart, even when the world seemed to be falling apart around her. How many of you guys want that? You want that in your life when things are going sideways around you. So maybe for you, the circumstances or your surroundings around you have caused you to question the goodness of God and his power or his desire to bring peace and joy to your life. And so can I remind you to let go and let God Let go and let God, which doesn't mean give up. It means stay engaged. So I want to give you two scriptures, and the takeaway today is this. I just want you to commit these two scriptures to memory. Like, I'm giving you memory verses. If anybody, the very first memory verse, there was two. Very first, very first two. That's not real. Memory verses that I ever learned, whereas one was out of Psalms and one was out of Proverbs. Psalm 119, 105 uh, is a light to my path. God's word is a light to my path and a lamp for my feet. And the second one I learned was Proverbs 17, 17. uh, A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And so through my growing up years, those were super easy scriptures to memorize. And I had grownups who made me memorize them. I had grownups ask me if I knew them. And so there was expectation that I had to know these things. But they were in my heart. They were in my mind. And so they marked the way I lived my life. They marked my worldview. They marked how I responded and engaged with people. They marked what I believed about myself because the word of God was written on my heart and I was letting it do something to me. So these two scriptures, I want you to memorize them. That means if you have to write them down, you have to take a screenshot of them. And then when you get home, you have to write them down and you have to put them somewhere where you're going to see them. And you just say them every day. Maybe you have to write them five times over in a row. And then the next day you try and write it without looking at it. Can you do it? Is it in your heart? Are you able to remember it? Psalm 55, 22 says this, give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. That's a good word. That's a good word. But I love that word because it's twofold. He's not going to permit the godly to slip and fall. And so I'm not just filling my heart and my mind with the word of God. I've got to act on it. I've got to be godly if I don't want to slip and fall. And that doesn't mean perfection. That doesn't mean going through the motions. That doesn't mean pretending. It just means let God work on the stuff in your heart. Be godly. He will not let the godly slip and fall. The godly are simply those who are leaning in and letting him work in their life, giving him all the things. And then the second one is Psalm 94, 19. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. And so again, you think, I don't know the Lord's comfort. And so that's not a promise for me. It doesn't work for me. But can I tell you, if you write it down and you start working on it, then your mind's going to go and your your heart is going to go. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope your comfort. I'm doubting and I don't feel it, but I want renewed hope and cheer that your your word says I can have. And your word says that if I'm burdened, I can give them to you and you're going to take care of me. You're not going to permit the godly to slip and fall. And so it's this, uh, it's this twofolded engagement where you're believing the promises of God, or at least you're trying to. You're trying to let go and let God work in your life. And so you're wrestling with them. You're, you're putting them in your heart. You're chewing on them. And then you're beginning to believe them. And so I want you to say these two verses every day until you don't have to look at them anymore. You just know them. And I want you to let them work on you until they move from words you know to words you believe. Not just words you know, but words you believe that actually give you hope. They give you peace. They give you comfort. Let Jesus be your teacher. And I want you to do the work of keeping his word in your heart and thinking about them often. Because if you do that, he will fill your heart with joy 
and he will fill your life with peace. And it doesn't mean that struggles aren't going to come and trials aren't going to come and those thoughts that might send you into a downward spiral are going to disappear forever. But what it does mean is that you're going to have the tools to fight back. And like Mary, if you treasure his words in your heart, the words of God in your heart, then you can face difficult things. You can face things that look incongruent. You can hold on to a promise for 30 years and believe that on the other side there's going to be hope. And so don't I, what I want us to do is not give up and lean in a little bit more to Jesus and believe that there is more promise in store for us. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your goodness and the hope of your word. I thank you for the invitation. Lord, that's always extended to us. And sometimes we, re we respond to it's the invitation to just come sit at your feet and to experience your power, to experience your goodness, to experience your glory. Lord, as we were singing those songs this morning, I was reminded of the passage in Scripture where it says the heavens were open and the, the prophet you were speaking to, he, he saw you and your, the train of your robe filled the temple. Like you filled the entire space. And then there were seraphim and, and crazy looking angels flying around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Majesty. You are great and awesome. You are so good. You are so powerful. And that is the God that we serve. Lord, you are, you are full of wonder. You are full of might. You are full of strength. And you love us enough that you sent your son as a baby in order to live life as a human so that you could have compassion for our needs, so that we could look to you as our Savior. We could look to you as our healer. We could look to you as our hope. We could look to you as someone who understands. And you paid the ultimate price to bring us in. And so we are grateful. We sit in your presence this morning, grateful for who you are and the love that you have for us. And I want to speak to two people groups in the room. The first one is if you've never said yes to Jesus, you've been dancing on the fence. Maybe you're in church for the first time or you've been coming around church. You have friends or family who believe in Jesus. But for you personally, you haven't made that decision that that's my Lord and Savior. And I believe that. And I want all of his hope and I want all of his goodness in my life. And I haven't done that yet that I'm talking to you. And then I'm talking to another group of people. And that's, you've been living in the land of the promise, but you've taken your eyes off the God of the promise. And so you're, you've been going through the motions. You've been doing this stuff. You've been in the land of the promise, but you haven't been engaged with the God of the promise. You haven't been letting him work on your heart and your mind and your life. You haven't been submitting to him in the ways that you know he's asking you to. You haven't received the blessing and the favor. And there's a wrestling going on within you because you're, you're there, but you're not quite there. And you, you're ready to, to give up on that and say, no, I'm coming all the way in. I want to be in the land of the promise with the God of the promise. And so if you fall into either one of those two camps, I just want you to lift your hand up in the air and I'd love to pray with you. If that's you, you're saying yes for the first time or you're leaning in all the way. Amen. 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 I see your hands. God is so good. Amen. I see your hand. Church, let's just together repeat this after me. Father God, I thank you for your son. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice. I have life because of you. I have hope because of you. I'm, I'm bought with a price. And I belong to you. I want to live in your presence. I want to experience your joy. I want to experience your goodness. I want to know your favor. I want to be filled with your peace. And I want to be a light in my life. And to the people around me, fill me with your spirit and lead me to do what's right. Amen.